Well, it is certainly good to see each of you here and how blessed we truly are as we count our blessings to be able to worship our God here today, to be able to be with each other, to spend the time that God has granted us to not only worship Him, but as today is that occasion to be able to spend even that extra time as we enjoy the good food that has been uh, cooked. I want to say built, and I knew that wasn't the right term. Cooked, and the fellowship that comes with that. As you guys know, we've been going over this whole year here on Sunday mornings, the theme of the life of Christ with a hope, as we said, to draw closer to our Lord and to our Savior based on uh, his life here and the things we can both learn from him and the way he conducted himself, the life he physically led here, and his spiritual life and the teachings that he so wonderfully blessed each and every one of us with. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 20 today. Specifically, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 16, wherein Jesus, having had a particular conversation with a rich young man right before this parable, we find ourselves discussing the last uh, hour steward, if you will, Jesus had just talked to, or rather a young rich man had just come to talk to Jesus, and he had asked Jesus a very important question. What must I do to have eternal life? Jesus begins by listing off some of the Ten Commandments and, and the realities and expectations of God in such, and the this young man says, listen, I have kept all of them, to which Jesus does not disagree. And he said, what am I lacking then? And Jesus, who knew him as a creator would, of his creation, told this young man, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, come follow me. And as you and I know, unfortunately, this young man who was very wealthy went away sad. His countenance had fallen. His head was down. And Jesus then explains to his disciples who had just witnessed this exchange between him and this young rich man that it was going to be very difficult for those who are extremely wealthy or rich to enter the kingdom of heaven in the kingdom of God, that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. This brought some questions naturally from the disciples. And so, so listen, if, if this guy couldn't get in and he had kept all these commandments from his youth, that you mentioned God, he only lacked this one thing. How can anyone get to heaven? How can anyone be saved? How can anyone have eternal life? Jesus then comforts them and says, listen, with man it's impossible. With God it's possible. But then Peter, who as you and I know, is sometimes one who would stick his own foot in his mouth every now and then. Peter sees the opportunity and says, hey, I was willing to give up everything for you. What do I get? Now, mind you, it hadn't been that long ago that John and his brother had been arguing and his mother had come to Jesus and said, hey, you know, where are my kids going to be in your kingdom? Are they going to be on your right and one on your left? That's what I want for them. And it hadn't been much longer after that that the disciples had been arguing amongst themselves who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, they were thinking of the physical kingdom as they were misunderstanding the prophecies of old about the church and the kingdom of God. But again, Peter, seizing this opportunity, says, what will we get? Listen, we've left everything. We've been following you. 
these three plus years. We've given up all. Now Jesus, knowing what Peter's really thinking, and knowing Peter's motives aren't exactly what they need to be, in our text explains to him the reality of how God's children need to really think. And he gives us this wonderful and powerful parable, the last hour steward, whom we're going to refer to throughout this lesson as the 11th hour laborer steward or servant. So if you have your hand out, let's go ahead now, look at our first point, and, and start getting into and examining this parable here in Matthew 20, 1 through uh, 20 here, or 1 through 16, because in this we see there are natural things that you and I would understand and would seem to make sense, and then there are some strange things that Jesus brings up and talks about here in this parable. And so there are several things that I want us to consider about that that are, as again, common that we would think of and, and some uncommon. The natural things we find in this is, is that someone, this master of a vineyard or home, he's a farmer. When it comes time to harvest time, he goes to the marketplace to find those who are looking for work. Now, you and I have probably seen this before. I know I have. Or maybe in your past time, or maybe you've gone to some of these areas where people congregate. Maybe it's uh, the unemployment uh, center or the union hall, maybe. At this time, it was the marketplace. You see pictures in, uh, of old days in New York where they would line up on ship docks and things, and, and the owners would come and say, hey, who wants to work today? And so we can relate with this first natural reality. The, the farmer, he has a harvest that's ready and he needs some work. So he goes where the workers are and he finds some. He finds some that are willing to work and they agree on the payment. Now again, because most of you here have got familiarity with farming and things like that, you know that Farming is not like most jobs. It's not something that you get up every morning to and you go to a place and you're there for just a few hours every single day or at least five days a week and then you get to come home and you're done with the work. No, there's certain times where the work is going to take a lot. There's certain times where the harvest is ready or the planting is needed or whatever the case may be. There's some down times. And then there's some major work times. Well, it was harvest time in this parable. So much so that we see 12 hours of necessary work. Twenty-four hour days were not always uncommon if they could find a light source. Now, we see another very common and natural thing, and though it's not for us today or not how things typically work today, these men, at the end of the day, were all paid for that day's work. And the reason for that was because not only what did it make sense that you had had someone labor and then you paid them, but that, and, and you might not see them the next day, as I said, they might not be in the marketplace the next day but also because the actual law of Moses required anyone you hired to pay them that day. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 13, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. To keep anyone from taking advantage of someone else, God made it law for the Israelites. Listen, when you hire someone, you need to pay them that day. Don't even wait till the next morning because maybe their family is hungry and they need to get to the, the market and, and, and buy some food. 
So God said, listen, when you hire them for that day and you hire them for that work, you pay them. And again, during this time, in the particular workers that are under consideration, these are day laborers. These are the ones who don't have a steady quote-unquote job. They work from day to day. What are some of the unnatural or strange things that we find in this parable? Well, not only does the farmer go in the morning, early in the morning, and find some men willing to work, but he keeps throughout the day continually going back to the marketplace, and as he keeps finding people, he keeps sending them out there, and though that's not fully unnatural, obviously when you have a harvest that needs to be done and you've got perishable goods, you want to get it taken care of very quickly. The unnatural thing, or the strange thing, is that he pays the same wage for the 11th hour laborer as he does the 12 hour laborer. In other words, the one who worked just one hour, he pays the exact same thing that he paid the one who had worked all day long for 12 hours. And yet, in this parable, God is without a doubt, Jesus is without a doubt comparing himself and the Father and the Spirit, God, to the master of the house and telling his disciples that you need to trust me on this. He's telling his disciples, remember what Peter had just been, mentioned. Hey, I've been with you from the beginning. I've given up everything. What greater thing shall I expect than the one who comes on the 11th hour to worship you, to obey you, to believe in you? So God says in a parable form, how I deliver this out, you can trust me. That you can be assured that I will do the right thing. And that you might not always understand why I've made a decision or why I've done something like this, God is telling Peter and the disciples. But I have my reasons. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8 where God said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Because God is so much more than us, because he knows so much more than us, God is able to tell us, listen, you might not always understand the decisions I've made, but I can guarantee you I'm just, I'm fair, and that I have a reason for everything I'm doing. That God knows what he is doing is the main lesson of this parable. Now, don't get me wrong. He did assure Peter, who was incorrect in what he was asking, Jesus kind of skips over that fact and lets him slide, if you will. He says, listen, I will take care of you. You follow me. You keep doing what's right. You've given up everything. Trust me, I, God, will take care of you. But then he wants to remind him in this parable, along with all the other disciples who had been arguing about this question and wondering, what's God going to do for me because I've done so much for him? And he reminds them that God, he's in charge. That he knows more than man could ever know. That he understands far more than any of us humans could ever understand or grasp. As God's children, when we say, God, I am putting my faith in you and I have faith in you, what we are telling God when we say this 
is God, I trust you. That no matter what happens in this life, that no matter what goes on that I don't understand, I know that you love me and want me to be with you forever, and so I trust you. Whether I'm dealing with financial difficulties or family difficulties or work difficulties or whatever the case may be, whatever's going on, when we tell God, listen, God, I have faith in you. I put my faith in you. That's saying I trust you. Again, we simply won't and don't always know why God has done what he's done or why at that moment it. we go through what we go through one of the things I like to bring up is Job God never told Job why he went through what he went through we know it was for us we know it was for everyone to know that you can trust God he'll take care of you even if the worst things happen but Job never knew why. In all the questioning Job gives, God finally, when he answers Job, Job's been begging for answers. He said, let me plead my case. God just simply says, are you God? Can you know my thoughts? Can you do what I've done? And Job, as a righteous man, says, I trust you. Whatever you say, you know. And you know what's best. That brings us to this very important lesson from the parable. There is a difference between quality and quantity. These two aren't always mutually the same. It's simply not always the case that quantity of work that we do makes us important because the reality is as you and I know the quality of the work we do matters just as much if not more in reality than the quantity let me explain if I'm going to go skydiving, I want the one who packs my chute to care about quality far more than quantity. I don't want to hear him say to his friend, man, I, his friend said, well, I got all five and the guys are going to jump out that plane. I got all five done. And the other one said, oh, well, I did 105. I'm a little worried there. Because there's a major difference between quantity and quality. It's not always the length, but the depth of the service to God that God considers. Now, with that in mind, when we think about that strange encounter between the 11th hour laborer and God, this reality of quality and quantity comes up. Do we really think that God is going to reward in this case or this farmer in this case is going to reward this 11th hour man the same wages as the one who had worked 12 days or 12 hours had he been slothful or slothful in what he did had he been lazy no i would venture to say the reason this man got as much as the others is because he worked as hard or harder than the rest. You can almost in your mind imagine him, especially when we look at how it turned out, not him being the last one to come in. He's trying to put in that good work. That reminds me of a story or not really an account that a preacher told me one time, an old time preacher, said he was holding a gospel meeting one time and they had a VBS and gospel meeting combined. They would do the VBS in the morning and the gospel meeting at the evening. 
And he said he noticed on the first day that there was an elderly gentleman there, but that this guy was involved in everything. He was helping lead the singing with the kids. He was helping take them around. If anyone said anything, he was the first one to get up and, and do and help. He was in the kitchen helping. He was over here helping. He was doing everything. And the preacher I know, he said, he, he asked the local preacher there, he said, you know, who is this guy? I'd, I'd like to get to know him. And he said, well, this is really kind of an interesting case because the congregation there had only been there for about three years or so. That it was actually a planted work like the one here way back when. And when they gathered the funds and built the building, this gentleman lived right next door to the building where the church was meeting. And so they ended up uh, getting to know each other and, and the members got to know the man and he ended up obeying the gospel. And, and the preacher I know, he was like, well, man, this is amazing. He's obviously a hard worker. And then it hit him. He said, wait a minute, just a few years ago? He said, yeah, he's been a Christian for about a year and a half, two years. I've been a Christian for a long time now. And I'm so thankful that I was able to grow up with parents who were taking me to services and parents who were helping me know what the church was. But the reality is sometimes those who haven't had that life appreciate more when they come to find that life in the 11th hour than the one who's been in it for 50 years. Because they've seen a lifetime and know a lifetime of living in sin. The reality is that like the 11th hour laborer who obviously worked his tail off, there are some who do more work in two years for the Lord than the one who's been a member of the church for 50. And what God is trying to get across to his disciples is not the amount of time or the quantity of years that one has served him. It's the quality of those years. The old preacher told me that gentleman didn't live very much longer after that gospel meeting. But in a few years, he had impacted so many people's lives. He had reinvigorated so many Christians who had been Christians for a long time to get out and work the work of God. When I think of this reality, I'm reminded of what James would say concerning faith, a trust in God, and the difference between quantity and quality. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, we read this, What good is it, brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace and be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, O oh, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled. This is Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified or saved by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified or saved by works when she received the message and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James in chapter 2 verses 14 through 26 says, Quality is worth more than quantity. Just because one says, well, listen, I've been saved or I obeyed the gospel way back when and for the last 50, 60 years, I've been uh, a child of God. God says, if it's not based in a quality of faith and faithfulness, then the quantity does not matter. Because the 11th hour laborer worked hard. And because he was rewarded for that hard work, that can unfortunately sometimes lead to a poor attitude from those who have more quality, quantity than quality in work. In fact, in our parable here, the one who had worked all day long was upset because he did not get more than the 11th hour laborer. And before we think, well, no one would do that, I can tell you personally, I have heard it said of one who had passed, who had only been a Christian for a short time, asked the question from a longtime member of the church, how is it that someone who can live such a horrible life so long? And at the last minute, obey the gospel. And it's true, they had only been faithful for about six months get to go to heaven like me. <laughs> what a dangerous attitude. What a poor attitude. What an unfaithful attitude. This type of attitude is easily what can lead to a lack of care for the soul of others and helping them See the quality of life in Christ before it's too late. The preacher who was telling us of this event said that he got a call after that gentleman had passed away just to let him know what had taken place. And the local preacher there told this preacher I know, he said that the gentleman who passed away, before he passed away, he said him and the preacher were talking. He was sick and he knew things were not looking good. And he told the preacher, he said, listen, I can't tell you how excited I am to know Jesus. All these years I had been without him and to have hope in my death he said but I wish that y'all had moved there sooner because I raised nine kids to 
to never know this faith, to never know this hope. And he said, I'm afraid that they'll never see me again. As we, who know that hope, who know the love of Christ and the joy it brings our life, let us always remember what this 11th hour actual laborer can teach us about this parable. The 11th hour laborer misses so much in their life. They miss an entire life of meaning and beauty. They miss almost an entire life of simply aimlessly walking without any true purpose. They miss a life of being blessed by the Father and having Jesus as a brother and no fellowship with the brethren. They have scarred themselves with sin throughout their life and ruined countless other lives because of their sin. The 11th hour laborers in so much pain from what they have done, we see it in the Apostle Paul's life, that they certainly don't need any pain from us, but rather a rejoicing that they have come to know God and have a love for Him and a comfort that comes from us in being a part of their lives even when these painful things they're reminded of. As we go throughout the rest of our lives, whether it be today or tomorrow or however long God blesses us, let us remember the lesson of the parable of the last hour steward, that 11th hour labor. And let us who know what it's like to have this good life, <clears throat> this life that's based on a knowing that God, our Creator, not just knows us, but loves us and wants to spend an eternity with us. Let us not care so much about the quantity or how long we've been a Christian or a child of God, but let us focus on the quality of each life within that of each day that we're blessed, that we may have an effect and an effect, well, not only on our lives in this, but in every single person we come in contact with. So that even if that one who's in their 11th hour of life, they may come to see the truth and God rejoice at their salvation. Just a few days ago on Facebook, I do believe, I saw a 96-year-old lady had been baptized, had put on Christ, and had her sins washed away, and put off that old one of sin. And one of the things that was captioned in that was, it's never too late, is it? It's never too late. This morning, let us remember that. Let us be reminded of that. And let us never forget this parable. It might be the case this morning upon this lesson or reflecting upon the things in which you've gone through, whether it be this week or in the past. And as you've been testing yourself to make sure you're in the faith, that you're really putting your trust in God like you should, you realize you've been found wanting in some areas. Maybe your labor hasn't been as quality controlled as it should. Maybe it's something else. If you find this to be the case, make that change now. Don't allow yourself to go out that door without rededicating yourself to God, coming back to Him through repentance, confession of sins, if you've already obeyed the gospel, and living for Him from this point on. 
we don't know how much time we have or that we have been granted. So let us make the most of each day. If you need that help this morning, if you need that encouragement or that strength, if you need that edification or you need that admonition, let the church be that help to you. Let us be a strength. Let us be a comfort. But we can't do either if we don't know. So if you need that today, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.